and draw a picture if you need to. So no one is going to tell you anymore. The, I mean, just give you the name and you can the average for the blah okay? Um, write the molecular weight of the atom in it too. So for example, S is what? Write down. Okay, I, I think I see someone did it wrong for the, uh, even though the molecular weight is already given. 32, okay, I have this, right? In the exam itself, I show sulfur atom, molecular weight is 32. Is 32 more than 29? Yes. yes. So H2S, two hydrogen and one sulfur, is that denser than N? Yes. Yeah. So molecular weight is more than some, some people. Okay. Most of the question that many of you did it wrong is this one. Okay. Maybe it's because it's on the next line, I don't know, but let's go look at it. The most popular one is. A cross heating value of natural gas is about 1,000 to 1,150 BTU per just one, okay? Standard foot of gas, not 1,000 standard cubic foot of gas, just one, okay? This is from the gas contract. Uh, try to review all this, it may happen again, okay? in a different form, or maybe exactly the same. It may not. Multiple shots, I like it. Could be. I have the time about two, three days to grade it, but how else I mean, I'm, all of you are graduating student, right? So for a regular student, I have more time, like one week and a little bit more. So it could be multiple shots. It may not be multiple shots. I haven't decided yet. If it is multiple choices, okay, I put it in the scantron, it's 20 minutes and it's done. Really easy, right? Yeah. Take home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 no, take home. Let's finish the time. Uh, can you restart the camera? Oh, it's already. It's already done. Okay. That's not that we need to know about the pump. I haven't gone through the horsepower calculation yet. Maybe I did just a little bit, but not in depth, okay? So video, we watch it. The type of pump, by now you know it. Okay, this is a summary, pump orientation. Basically, even when we say centrifugal pump, we have many kind of centrifugal pump. And it's not like you will use all that, no. When you go to the field trip, in the sundown, I think I have seen that one. This big thing, okay? I go back and I Google it, I found out, okay? They told me it's centrifugal pump, and it is centrifugal pump. Centrifugal pump sometimes looks like this, so we have API standard, okay? 610, 610 API standard, this is standard for the pump. API is a little bit more stringent than ANSI standard. I don't test you on that number, okay? What is the API standard for the pump? No, but I want you to know that the pump has a certain standard of it, okay, to regulate. All right, there are several types, OH1, OH3, OH6, that's API pump, okay? It can come in several kinds, uh, okay. One thing that you want to know, okay, how does it look like? When it is centrifugal pump, so internally it has that blade, right? Externally, we have to put a bolt or several bolts to connect it together. Sometimes these bolts arrange in the circle shape, radially, okay? So this we call radially split, okay? Sometimes the bolt is not in the circle line. Okay, it's not in this circle shape. Sometimes the bolt is from the top. And the shape is like not circle, like irregular, like that. So this is when we remove the bolt, we take the top part out. Okay? This time we call it axially split. Okay. Memorize this. 
Uh, I think last year I had to comment that I didn't learn anything from this class except realistic and explicit. So he indeed knows something. So the good thing with regular split is when it's getting hot, what happens if it is uniform? It's, so it uniformly expanding. So this means regular split is good for higher temperature. But if not, if it is not uniformly like axial split, if it is not uniformly distributed, when it's getting hot and it swell or have the more expansion, it may not uniformly expand. Okay, so that's why I put over here. Radial split, higher T and P, higher temperature and pressure than axial split. This is the part that you need to know. Okay. All right, axial split. When, when we look at this centrifugal pump, centrifugal pump, as you know, that it has several shapes. Okay, it come in different form. Uh, but eventually, okay, you see the ball over there. So this time it is what? Axially or horizontal uh, split? Radially split. Axially split? Radially split. Okay. This is radially split. This one is axially split. This one I cannot see you like very clear, but from this you can see. Okay? There are limited number of pictures that I can show you too. So you may memorize the picture if you need to. Okay, actually split, palm casing is split as into upper half and lower half. It is always a horizontal palm. Advantage palm internal can be inspected by simply remove the top case. No need to remove rotor. So we can take it apart easier. Relatively inexpensive for three stages or more compared to regular split. This advantage, non-uniform thermal expansion. Most of the time is limited to 400F. Okay. Non-symmetrical shape, irregular case, gasket, so it's limited to that pressure, which is quite high, but it's maybe if we have greater split, it can do higher pressure and temperature. Can be very expensive for three or more stages, need double for a construction or something. So radial split, the reason that we want it is about uniform thermal expansion. Okay? This is another API. Um, type of pump vertically suspended. So when it looks like this, it's still centrifugal pump, we spin it and it can uh, suck the pump, suck the liquid from the bottom to the top. Okay, we have uh, put everything all together. This looks like uh, ESP, right? So this is a liquefied natural gas pump that I get a picture from the internet, and that's a website. Okay, we have several kind of pump. Uh, MC and API. <coughs> API has more stringent rule than MC. Okay, and this is the type of so regular MC pump. They look like this. API pump, a little bit different. So this is one common type of NC and API. But API has several, okay, same as that. So this is just the detail, okay, how is, but when you see it, you can tell, okay, it is really split or zip, yes. Bottom of the casing, so this is just for reference, okay, we don't test you on this. Can we test you on if it is ready to split or just that. And you know when you see it, you know that this is a pump. When you see this picture, what is it? It is a centrifugal pump or a reciprocating pump, you tell us the uh, centrifugal pump, you're done. Okay? So review this, it's another type of the pump, another type of the pump. Okay, this is all modest stage. Uh, this is okay. What about that? Really split or axial split? So this is, all of them are centrifugal pumps. Okay, centrifugal pump, some pump is another um, centrifugal pump, centrifugal pump, okay. Submersible pump is a centrifugal pump, okay. Detail, review it, okay. Um, how do we put them together? 
You will see the pump curve that for a centrifugal pump, the curve is not a straight line. So for <coughs> reciprocating pump or PD pump, the, the pump curve is almost a straight line, right? So this means if I have two pump, two pump in series, so I have one pump and two pump, then when I have two pump, I look at my system curve. What happens with two pump in series? Pressure should go up, right? But it's not double. It's up, but it's not double. So I go from here to there. Okay. Put two pump in series, increase discharge pressure, but does not need to double the discharge pressure. It is dependent on the system curve too. Okay. Put two centrifugal pump in parallel, increase the flow rate, but does not need to double the flow rate. This is dependent on the pump curve too. Okay. So if you put uh, PD pump, okay, PD pump will increase the flow rate almost double because the pump curve is more straight. Got it? So put two pump in parallel, increase the flow rate. <coughs> but we still need to consider the system curve for the case of centrifugal pump. Okay, the node for PD is over there. Any questions on this? No question, no question, no question? Alright. Centrifugal pump parallel installation example. Okay. Each pump has isolation valve, so that one pump can run while other is in service. What is isolation valve? What do you think? Do you think anything? John, John, John. What is isolation valve? What is isolation valve? Close insertion and discharge size to isolate the pump. That's the one. So basically we have the pump. And with on the suction side and the discharge side, we have the valve. We close those valve, then we can remove the pump out, right? So I have two lines like this. So I have valve over there, valve over there, valve over there, valve over there, and I have the pump in the middle. So if pump number two need repair, I can close that valve, close that valve, and pump number one can still run. Okay, that's how we put them together. Such a line and isolation valve should be rated for discharge pressure. Why? Why is that? Even suction valve and suction line should be discharge pressure. For the case where suction is closed and discharge valve is open, okay, sometimes we may close the discharge valve. If we close the discharge valve, the pressure keeps building up. So pump has to be rated for the discharge pressure in both lines. Okay. Check valve is installed in the discharge side of each pump. We need check valve. Check valve is to make flow go in one direction. Doesn't flow back. Okay. Prevent any reverse flow. Install vent and drain connection to remove any liquid inside of the pump for maintenance. So if we want to make, do the repair on the pump, we may have to drain the liquid out first. Uh, <coughs> install the throttling valve to control the flow rate without turning the pump on or off. So what is that thing for? Can we do it something else? How do we control flow rate from the pump if we need to? We can use a variable frequency drive. Okay, variable frequency drive, but that's more expensive. Or we can use a throttling valve. We close the valve more, so it flows less, right? So we artificially add more restriction According to the pump curve, when we have more restriction, it flows a little bit less. If we want it to flow more, we open the valve more. Okay, that's how we do it. Okay, but if we close it all the way for a centrifugal pump, and the pump is on, is that okay? It is still okay, and it is preferred to start it with close the discharge valve. So we to start the pump, we close the discharge valve for the centrifugal pump. We close the discharge valve. We let it run and then we open it. And we will go over that in water flooding facility that Mr. Gulak will cover. Okay. For the PD pump, if I did that, it's gonna be disaster. The pipe will burst. Okay, we need the pressure to be back. 
Don't pump against the dead end. Don't pump dry for the case of uh, PD pump. Okay. Uh, the rest, low and high pressure switch. Okay, this we is about instrumentation being started to sense the discharge pressure. If discharge pressure is too much, maybe something happened. There's a blockage somewhere. Okay. If there is any blockage or discharge valve is accidentally closed, high pressure switch, set the alarm, and turn off the pump. Okay, so if something bad happens, we don't want the pump to keep running. Okay, so we need a high pressure switch, low pressure switch. If there's a leak, if there's a leak, low pressure switch will send alarm to turn off the pump. Okay, so if I have the pump installed properly, it's not just a pump, it's not a pump and some sensor, okay? High, low pressure speed. If there's a leak, so the pressure will be a lot less than usual. You suspect that there's a leaking happen, right? So if, or the, if the pressure view are too high, you suspect that there's some blockage of the pipe. Okay, good? Very firm. Good, you good? All right, all right. Pretty pump. This is an internal part. We have a puncture, discharge, valve check, suction, valve check. Okay, so this is already part of the pump. Okay, we have the ball that goes up and down. Uh, reciprocating pump advantage is more efficient. Okay, efficiency remains high regardless of the pump speed, although it tends to decrease slightly in increasing speed. Uh, read this. Okay, read this thing. Okay, memorize part of it, the green thing. Okay. This green thing you should memorize or write it down at least. Okay, read this by yourself. Basically, disadvantages of reciprocating pump is because it has pulsating flow. It requires more space, need more NPSHR. Uh, by the final exam time, you need to be able to write the full name of NPSHR. What is NPSHR stand for? Okay, NPSHA, NPSHR. Polar handling solid or something. What about this picture? It shows that there is something spinning. When there is something spinning, it doesn't mean that it's centrifugal. So this is PD type, positive displacement. Okay, it's uh, directly push a certain amount of liquid forward. Okay. This kind of pump you have less pulse, or maybe it doesn't have pulse, okay? Because it's kind of more continuous than using the distance. So we have screw pump, sliding wave, positive cavity, or single screw. We have two screw, low pump, internal gear, external gear, okay? Diaphragm, okay, diaphragm can run dry periodically, can handle dirty liquid. Okay, this is a popular one to ask in the exam. The diaphragm pump. Which pump is good at handling dirty liquid or high solid content? Diaphragm pump. Inexpensive, require frequent maintenance, not for high discharge pressure, not for high flow rate. So it's just a diaphragm move inside that pump. You remember that, right, in the video. Uh, positive displacement, rotary type, we can have this designed to pump toxic liquid. Okay. Uh, this kind of pump can rotary pump, can do toxic liquid. I don't plan, plan to test you on which pump uh, can do toxic liquid because it's, we normally don't have that. Uh, but just so you know that toxic liquid, there are certain pump, they call can rotary pump that can handle that. Okay. Manifest pump. Manifest pump can use for subsidy facility. Okay. Extending subsidy type back this time. Multiple satellite, blah 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 blah. Reduce the subsidy development cost. So install this manifest pump in the subsidy will reduce the, the development cost. Typically we have two screw pump or uh, helicoaxial pump. Let's take a look at it. So two twin screw, helicoaxial, there's a comparison between gas volume fraction, okay, the maximum gas volume fraction 
for this, can do this much cash flow fashion, this, okay. So both of them can be used. This is the difference between each of them. So like this one up to one million barrel, this one maybe lower barrel per day, okay. Low viscosity, can do two centipoy, or high as four thousand centipoy, can do more pressure for helicoaxial. Do I test you on this? No, just you should know that we have helicoaxial manifest palm and twin screw manifest palm. It look like this. They put it, manifest palm is half the cage and they put it on something. Okay? That kind of palm, how many horsepower do we need? What is what kind of information do you need to calculate the horsepower? You need just two numbers. What are those? Uh, Carriage the glass cake. The glass cake, okay. What are those two numbers that we need to calculate the horsepower? <laughs> what are those two numbers that we need for calculate horsepower of the pumps? Do we need to know how heavy it is? I mean the pump weight, the weight of the pump itself, is it relevant? Probably not. How about flow rate? Yeah. How about head? Yes. How much pressure that it can withstand? So it needs just pressure and volume flow rate. It becomes power or horsepower. Okay, and we will review that. Very soon, okay. Reciprocating pump installation, NPSHA must be more than NPSHR. Use 45 degree elbow instead of 90 degree because it has less um, acceleration or pressure loss. Okay. Uh, maximum suction and discharge pipe, velocity for reciprocating pump, the pump speed, suction velocity, discharge velocity. Why, why do I want you to look at this number? Okay. This is a typical value of the velocity that is recommended. If your velocity inside the pipe is 20 feet per second, there's something wrong with that. See what I'm saying? So this gives you some idea on what is the range. What is, what is, what should be the pipe size that connect with the pump? Of course, the pump manufacturer will tell what is the pipe size, but this is a typical value of the velocity. Reciprocating pump installation, Okay, we have discharge isolation valve, suction isolation valve. Those can be accidentally closed during startup, can be accidentally closed and after it leak. So we may we will need pressure relief valve to both suction and discharge side. Okay. So if it sucks but the suction valve closed, what happened? Im or X? Implode or explode? Implode. So the suction valve closed, we try to suck when it's closed, it's inflow. So we try to push when it's closed, it's explode. Or busted. So we have um, install isolation, isolation valve, okay. We install cone strainer at the pump suction to prevent any solid. How, how does it look like this cone strainer? It's like a mesh that catch any solid particles. But we should not have solid particles, so we should not have solid particles to the pump, right? We have low pressure alarm, high pressure alarm. Low pressure alarm is for the case that there's a leak, okay? Or there's a plug somewhere on the suction line. High pressure alarm lower than the relief valve set point. Or should it be higher? The high pressure alarm should be higher than the pressure lock, pressure relief valve set point. No, right? We should try to use the alarm to turn off the pump. But if it takes too much time to turn off the pump and we cannot turn it off on time and the pressure is too high, then we use the pressure relief valve. Good? Right. Control method. Okay, this is in the exam that we get and I promise you I will try. I will try, okay. Maybe, maybe it's not that, but I will try to ask you something about this. How saving control? Okay. Pulsation control, we have three ways of doing it. We don't want the pulse that come from the pump. The pulse makes everything check, okay? And it may cause 
fatigue over time. One way of doing it is use liquid fill vessel. Okay. Liquid fill vessel, write that name into your information sheet. Okay, liquid fill vessel. Second one, gas cushion vessel. Okay, you have to write that name down. Tune acoustic dampener. Okay, that's the way of doing it. Okay. In short, okay, liquid fill vessel, how can it reduce the power? It uses the fluid compressibility itself to absorb the power. So liquid is a little compressible, but not very much. So because it's little compressibility, we will need to use big tank. So the tank size is 10 times of the flow rate in the volume per minute. So if I have 50 barrel for 5 barrel per minute pump speed, okay, the tank size has to be 50 barrel for 5 barrel per minute pump speed to absorb any pumps. Low pressure block. No maintenance needed, take a lot of space, no moving path. Okay? So this is to control the pulse. When it has a pulse, the compressibility of the fluid is like expand a little bit, very small, but it can absorb the pulse. Gas cushion vessel is using bladder. Okay? So we have gas field bladder over there. When there's a pulse come, the pulse, they push against the bladder, so the bladder kind of shrink or compress, okay? The bladder size going down. So when there's no pulse or pulse in the negative direction, the, the bladder go up. So bladder keep going down to absorb any pulse, okay? So, it, so the bladder itself has to not have gas dissolved in liquid or something. Gas cushion diameter is much smaller than liquid fuel diameter. Bladder can get fatigue over time. Bladder has a temperature limit. Okay. So if you have a temperature concern, you may not use bladder. To an acoustic diameter, how does it work? Okay. I show you over here because it can work for real. Okay. The reason that we study it in this class. Because it works for real, I shake it. Most of the time, how they design it is require expensive software. Okay, the expensive part is not the, the equipment itself, but it's the design. Okay, it's kind of proprietary product. You don't know, you ask them, they tell you this this uh, value by that unit and it works. It have two uh, two tank. Okay, and you have a short tube. So it have a tube connect in the middle. So. It requires acoustic engineering calculation, vessel and choke side adjustment to a specific resonance frequency to allow pressure pulsation from the pump at the frequency above the resonance frequency to be attenuated significantly. So it's based on the resonance frequency. Uh, so it will remove any high frequency pulse. Okay. So if we have Gas cushion vessel I use, the low amplitude pulse will be filtered too. So high high frequency pulse remove use this acoustic dampener. Okay. Sometimes you will get something strange that is not quite common in this class. So that is like sometimes they say, okay, use this magnet, put it down hole, it remove any vast or anything. Um, maybe you want to question that. I have, my friend has a company uh, in Thailand and some people try to sell them $4 million, okay? It's, it's like a magic rod made of some kind of magnet. They said if you remove anything, it won't get stick or something. That is a uh, scam, okay? Also, <laughs> but this is for real, okay? Acoustic diameter, it works for real, there's a magnet that it works. New technology keep coming, so evaluate it with your engineering skill. If it's if it seems to be too good to be true, uh, request for the evidence. <clears throat> so this kind of thing doesn't have like moving part, right? So it's maintenance free. Vibration prevention, okay? We don't go over the map of this, okay? Just so you know that there's a method. So this part is to be covered in the graduate level. There's a method to calculate what is the uh, uh, Acoustic wavelength that is needed, what is the frequency that has to be damped, 
So basically, okay, you have to do with adiabatic bulk modulus. Of course, you don't do that, and you probably don't pay attention because you, it's not in the exam. There's a chart to do that, okay? Uh, so at the end, we don't try to put the support in the regular interval, okay? If you put the support in the regular interval, it could make the pipe itself to shake. Okay, to vibrate. But we, if we have more support, it's less, to, it's less chance to vibrate. If you want to know exactly what is the interval of the support of the pipe, do that calculation. Okay? This calculation tells me okay, if we want to prevent any pipe vibration, what do we do? How, how often, at what distance, that those support should be less than. Okay? Uh, I think that's from Arnold Stewart. Okay? Let's go to uh, reciprocating pump classification, okay? One cylinder we call simplex, two cylinder duplex, three cylinder triplex. You know that already. But read this, okay? This is when we select, when we not select cylindrical pump. Generally, we select cylindrical pump unless cover speed and the pumping head fall within the area level of positive displacement pump. What does it mean? You use uh, this chart. Okay, this pump one. So basically, that thing tell me that we use. Oh, okay. There's a pump chart that tell in this region we should use uh, positive displacement pump. If the viscosity is greater than one thousand centibar at the pumping temperature. We should use uh, um, reciprocating pump. Percentage of undissolved gas by volume is greater than five percent of gas is not well dispersed. Okay. The percentage of solid by volume is greater than that of solid are not well dispersed. <clears throat> the pump is expected to run dry without automatic shutdown provision pumping pump. So. I think that is for select centrifugal pump. Right? We don't use this uh, centrifugal pump for this condition, right? Right. Right. We uh, we don't actually for the reciprocating pump we don't run dry either. Pump doesn't pump gas. The pump doesn't pump gas. If we have gas, pump doesn't pump gas. So both pump should not run dry, okay? Centrifugal pump, maybe during the startup that we have cell pumping, okay? Uh, if we have gas, we should not use, we, we have to do something with that before we use the pump. If it's too viscous, we may, we may not use centrifugal pump, okay? Uh, so this is just a guideline, maybe it's not that clear, but you remember this. Don't run dry. Pump, it's not supposed to run dry, okay? It should not have gas, okay? Pump should not have gas, just that. Okay, and PSHA, I think we go over this, and we talk about the uh, vapor pressure, right? Pressure at the head, uh, absolute pressure on the surface, above liquid. Are you comfortable with using this? I think we go over it previously, okay? We have the suction head, absolute pressure on the surface of the tank, absolute vapor pressure, static head at the inlet above the pump, accelerational head. How do we calculate acceleration head? Anyone tell me? We use a chart to get E sub V, okay? H sub A comes from E sub V term. You remember that? Every elbow has acceleration of pressure loss. Static head of inlet above the pump. Center line. So I look at the, the pump at the center line. If the tank has a liquid level well above that, so this distance is HST. Okay. HP is the pressure in the tank. If tank is closed and it's half gas on the top, and that gas is like 10 psi or, or converted to feet, so that is HP. Okay. Vapor pressure, of course, is a negative value. It's more difficult to pump up to it than to go through it. Good? I think we covered this already at PSHA. Great. 
uh, HA, acceleration of pressure loss. This is there's a formula for the set, uh, HA is zero for centrifugal pump. pump. Otherwise, okay, HA is one. Okay. So acceleration here is something else over here. This is a formula. It's have C, RP, okay, G and K, compressibility factor. So this thing, if you want to write anything, write just that. Because the rest, like C value, I have to give you, oh, of course, you need to know L, V, P or something. So this helps you. What is H sub A for this equation for the case of centrifugal pump that is like more, uh, more accurate? So, <coughs> centrifugal pump, H A is zero. Reciprocating pump, there is additional acceleration of pressure loss. Additional pressure, uh, acceleration of pressure loss. This depends on actual length of the suction pipe, velocity in the pipe, pump speed in RPM, and the pump type, G value, K value. Okay, no compressibility or something. All right, this is for acceleration of pressure loss of reciprocating pump. Uh, maybe it is, it's quite a lot. How about how about it? If it is in the exam, this slide will be given. Okay. If it is in the exam. Maybe you don't need to write anything. How about that? If it is in the exam, this slide will be given, but you have to be able to put it in and do the calculation. Alright. <coughs> what is the G value over here? 9.8 or 32.2? 32. 32.2. 32. Okay, of course, because everything else is kind of the engineering unit, right? right? Okay. Last thing, the last three minutes, let's do horsepower calculation. HHP, hydraulic horsepower, is HP pump head multiplied by rho multiplied by Q over 550. Are you comfortable with this equation? What is that 550? One horsepower equal to 550. Our force foot per second, right? So HP is head in feet. So it need pressure drop multiplied by volumetric flow rate. Volumetric flow rate has to be kilo foot per second. Okay. So what is that has to do with you at all? Look at other equations. We have some of specific gravity. Q prime, Q prime is a flow rate in GPM. Okay. And HP is a pump head in feet. And we have different conversion factor. You got to be able to get that. Okay? What about 1714? So we have flow rate multiplied by delta P. What about it? So we have power is Q prime, which is flow rate in gallon per minute, multiplied by delta P is in PSI. Why do we have that number formula? How do we get it? You will tell me how do we get that. Okay, this has to do with, we start everything with SI format. SI format is Q, okay, cubic meter per second multiplied by delta P in Pascal. Okay. Uh, we will review this next time too, but for right now, what you need to know is pressure is Pascal. Pascal is force per unit area. Right? Force per unit area. So we have flow rate, which is volume per second. When we do the math, we get force time length. Force time length is energy divided by second become power. Unit of power in SI is watt. Okay? So if you know the conversion between watt and horsepower, that's it. And you can also do all these things. All right? Uh, one more minute left. Try to review this question. If you are ready for the exam, you should be able to answer all this without any reference, okay? For the code session out there. Thank you for coming. See you Thursday. Yes.